The Boulder Foothills, home of the famous Flatirons, are one of Colorado's most iconic locations. Every year, thousands of tourists and locals hike on these mountains. The Flatirons, dozens of tilted rock slabs up to a thousand feet tall, are extremely popular among scramblers and climbers. The geology behind these monoliths is quite interesting. In this presentation, I will be going through the geologic history and emergence of these foothills and flatirons. The foothills have been uplifted such that the formations have a dip of about 50 degrees to the east, perpendicular to the strike of the range front. This, combined with erosion and vegetation, means that many of the geologic layers are hidden inside the foothills, making them challenging to observe from the front. Fortunately, seven miles south of Boulder lies El Dorado Canyon. This beautiful, steep-walled gorge gives us a cross-sectional view of the units, acting like a geologic timeline where the age of the rock increases as one travels up the canyon to the west. I'll be using this natural history book to explain the composition and genesis of the different geologic units that make up these foothills. I'll then discuss the geologic processes that resulted in the landscapes that we see today. In order to understand the geology of these foothills, we need to go back in time to see what things were like before they existed. We can do this by traveling up El Dorado Canyon to the backside of the foothills in order to observe the oldest layers here. As we move upstream, the layered sedimentary rocks that we've observed all the way up the canyon run into a vast area of granite with occasional ridges of white quartzite. By looking at geologic maps of this area, we can see that this granite is part of a unit called the Boulder Canyon Granodiorite. This Precambrian igneous rock formed 1.7 billion years ago during ancient mountain building events and volcanic activity. Magma made its way into the surrounding earth, eventually cooling into granite. Ancient sandstone in the vicinity of this magma was metamorphosed into white quartzite, visible today as the white ridges near the back of the canyon. As we look down the canyon, these very old rocks give way to sedimentary rocks that make up the rest of the canyon. However, upon looking at this contact, we see something odd. The sandstone adjacent to the granite is part of the fountain formation, the same geologic unit that makes up the Flatirons. The reason that this is interesting is that the fountain formation was deposited about 280 million years ago, meaning that there's over 1 billion years of missing geologic history here. How did this happen? Well, at one point, all the missing sediment was in place atop the granite. However, between 1.7 billion and 300 million years ago, huge amounts of erosion and weathering wore the sediment down, erasing it from the record. Eventually, it was eroded down to this Precambrian bedrock, which acted like a canvas for the fountain formation to be built upon. To understand how the fountain formation formed, it's important to mentally untilt the mountain so that the layers are horizontal. This is how it would have been at the time of deposition. 300 million years ago, an orogeny took place that created an ancestral mountain range in the same location as the modern Rocky Mountains, or about 35 miles west of this location. As weathering and erosion took place, huge rivers carried this broken down material downstream. During the Pennsylvanian period, about 280 million years ago, this sediment was deposited on top of the Precambrian bedrock in a 1,000 foot thick deposit we call the fountain formation. If we look at the fountain formation today, it consists of many layers. The majority is coarse grained tan sandstone, but layers and lenses of conglomerate, as well as brown mudstone and siltstone exist, giving it the beautiful striped appearance. This variation of sediments is consistent with a fluvial, or river, depositional environment, and this specific area was likely an alluvial fan. The alternating sequence of rock type represents fluctuations in the speed of the water moving across this fan. The conglomerate and coarse grained layers were deposited in fast moving water, while the fine grained layers were deposited in very slow moving water, possibly when channels overflowed banks and spread out. And what about those pretty colors? The vibrant shades of red and gold are what give the canyon its name. Earlier explorers first thought it resembled the lost city of gold. The red and orange shades come from hematite, a type of iron ore that precipitated out of groundwater. The brilliant yellow and green streaks are often the work of crustose lichen growing on the walls. The sedimentary rock in this unit is arcosic, meaning the grains and cobbles are made from granite. This 
along with the conditions it was lithified in and the unique cement that holds the grains together, makes it significantly harder and more resistant than most sandstones. Climbers love this rock, and many mistake it for granite. This unit makes up the flat irons also, which, due to the resistance and differential erosion, exist in large monoliths extruding from the slopes of the foothills. I'll discuss the flat irons in more detail later. Moving down the canyon, we see a large change in the appearance of the rock. This represents a new geologic unit, the Lions Formation Sandstone. The Lions Formation is very different from the Fountain Formation. The rock is a beautiful red or pink color, it's made of fine grains, and it's very uniform. Looking closely, one can see cross bedding in places, which can be used to determine the prevailing wind directions throughout that time. Lion sandstone formed during the Permian period, about 250 million years ago. At this time, this part of Colorado was a dry and windy desert. Large sand dunes formed, composed of grains still eroding from the ancestral Rocky Mountains to the west. Today, the lion sandstone breaks into perfect thin slabs, and therefore has been quarried for flagstone in many places along the foothills range. It's much less resistant than the fountain formation. El Dorado Canyon gives us a view of this unit from the side, but from the front of the mountain, the lion sandstone does not exist in cliffs. Any outcrops have been eroded down, leaving a talus field below the flat irons. This even, linear talus field represents the lion's formation. The next younger formation is challenging to directly observe, even in El Dorado Canyon. At this point, we're approaching the range front of the foothills. East of the Lions Formation lies a valley that runs perpendicular to the range. This linear valley represents the Lincolns Formation, a very weak sandstone that has mostly been heavily eroded. During the time of deposition, the climate had changed drastically from the time of the Lions Unit deposition, which remember, at this point, Colorado was a dry, windy desert. Now, a warmer, wetter climate existed. A shallow sea covered the area, resulting in tidal flats. Algae thrived here, and evidence for this can be seen in stromatolites, fossils left over from algae growing around sediments. Looking at this area today, the rock can be seen in the bottom of the valley, mostly as dirt, soft mudstone, and red sandstone. The east side of this valley is the Dakota Hogback, our next unit. The Morrison and Dakota units create a linear hogback that runs along the base of the foothills. This hogback is due to the softer sediments on either side of the unit, which eroded away much faster. During the time when these sediments were deposited, there was a massive inland sea called the Great Interior Seaway, which stretched hundreds of miles across the interior of North America. Around 150 million years ago, the western shore of this sea reached our area. So the sediments in this unit are shallow marine and beach deposits. This environment is great for preserving fossils. The Morrison and Dakota formations are famous for fossils, including larger vertebrate ones. East of the Dakota hogback are the final three units that I will discuss. These final units are all shales, limestones, clays, and chalks, formed as the inland sea became deeper. They are called the Benton, Niobrara, and Pierre shales. These marine deposits host many fossils. The Pierre Shale is the last formation that is part of the foothills. It's a large unit that Boulder sits on top of, and it remains on or near the surface for a few miles to the east. This unit is also where much of Colorado's oil reserves are. As it dips deep under the Great Plains to the east, high pressures convert the shale into fossil fuels. Now we have discussed how each layer of the Boulder foothills were deposited but how were they tilted and formed into the topography that we observe today? Let's go back in time to where we left off. Throughout the upper Cretaceous period, the fine sediments of the Pierre Shale were being deposited at the bottom of a sea. The other layers I discussed were buried thousands of feet below, starting to lithify due to the intense heat, pressure, and chemistry. Then, about 70 million years ago, a mountain building event known as the Laramide Orogeny occurred. This is what uplifted the modern Rocky Mountains. Most mountain ranges occur near a plate boundary, but this one was unique. Normally, during subduction, an oceanic plate subducts under a continental plate and drops deep into the mantle. This creates a mountain range near the coast, like the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest. But in this case, instead of subducting into the mantle, 
the Pacific plate rode along the bottom of the North American plate for some distance before dropping down. This is called shallow subduction. It created friction and caused compressional forces, resulting in the uplift of a mountain range in the middle of the continent. So these units were raised up, but where did the tilt come from? This is because the crest of the Rocky Mountains is about 30 miles west of this location, and that's where the uplift occurred. Think of it like a drawbridge. As the middle rises, the sides become steeper. This resulted in the dip of the units that can be easily observed today. Between then and today, huge amounts of erosion have taken place, carving the mountains into their current shape. But erosion wasn't the only thing that affected these mountains. During this time, there is plenty of active faulting taking place. These faults further influence the shape of the foothills. One great example of this can be seen on Green Mountain, the peak that hosts the famous numbered flatirons. Two parallel layers of fountain sandstone can be seen, one exposed as the famous flatirons, and the other as the summit ridge of Green Mountain and the sacred cliffs. A layer of Precambrian granite is squeezed between. This is due to the Maxwell Fault which slid the summit of Green Mountain in from elsewhere. El Dorado Canyon was formed at the end of a recent ice age when vast amounts of water rushed down a powerful river that dug its way through the foothills. But what formed the shape of the iconic flatirons? The flatirons are unique. Notice that these monoliths only form in the fountain formation unit. All the other units are too soft and rock outcrops have eroded away. Another interesting thing to note is that Boulder is the only place in Colorado where flatirons like this form. The fountain formation actually extends across most of the state, but this seven or so mile stretch is the only place where flatirons have formed. Part of this is due to the cement that holds the sandstone together, giving it an unusual hardness and resistance to weathering. According to an article by Lon Abbott, this cement only formed near Boulder because on two occasions in the past, warm, potassium-enriched water welled up along an ancient fault zone. This water flowed through the grains as they were being lithified. The fountain formation's grains reacted chemically with the water to form rims of agillaria that tightly bind its grains together. Agillaria cement makes this rock very popular among climbers due to the hardness and strength. One interesting thing to note is that this is one of the only areas where you're allowed to climb on sandstone after it rains. In most sandstone climbing areas, you have to wait a few days after the rain because the rain can soak into the rock and make it weaker. This is not an issue in El Dorado Springs and the Flatirons. A second process that determines the shape of the Flatirons is something called differential erosion. In the last part, I explained how Agillaria cement has made the fountain formation especially resistant in this area. But looking closely, not all of the rock here is so resistant. Looking at a section of this rock, we can see that there's several different layers. The darker layers, composed of weaker siltstones and mudstones, are not very resistant to weathering. As the outcrops are exposed, these weak layers are removed quickly due to weathering and erosion. This leaves deep slots in the cliffs. Rock is very strong when it comes to compressional forces, but it's weak in tensile strength. When large rock overhangs form, gravity pulls down on the rock, surpassing the tensile strength. These overhangs break off, resulting in a larger slot that eventually resembles a gully. These gullies fill with broken down material, which becomes soil, allowing trees to grow. The sharp, linear bedding planes between the sandstone and siltstone mean that as the weaker layer is eroded off, lower, stronger layers are left exposed as smooth, flat slabs. As this process continues, many separate ridges and monoliths form, which is what we see today in the flatiron. We can easily observe this process in Skunk Canyon, the picture on the left. You can see rock ridges separated by tree-filled gullies. In the past, this was all one block, and the current location of the gully corresponds to a weak rock layer in the stratigraphy. The weak layer eroded away, leaving a deep slot. Over time, the overhanging side of the slot has collapsed, creating two separate blocks with a gully in between. The slot continues to grow into the mountain and the overhang continues to collapse. As this occurs, the bottom block forms a slab, which used to be the bottom of the slot. The upper block becomes narrower as it collapses. This process results in the topography we observe. We have now walked through the history and formation of the Boulder foothills. 
volcanic activity, ancient mountain ranges, powerful rivers, desert sand dunes, beaches, inland seas, potassium-rich cement, orogenies, erosion, weathering, faulting, and more. All these processes have come together to create the beautiful topography that so many boulderites and tourists alike love so much.